Let's get started. Uh, our speaker today is Professor Daniela Chabrich from the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department at the University of California, Los Angeles. Her research interests include known radio architecture, signal processing, communications, machine learning, and networking techniques for cognitive radio, 5G, and massive microsystems. She received the Samuel Fellowship, Kava Foundation Research Grant, Hamlin Fellowship, and the National Science Foundation Career Award. Uh, she serves as the uh, editor of three journals currently, and she is a senior member of the IEEE and a contact distinguished speaker. Let's give her a warm welcome. Thank you, Andrew, for a nice introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's really a great pleasure to visit uh, UC uh, Irvine and uh, be your uh, seminar speaker today. Um, I'm a faculty in electrical and computer engineering, and I understand this is a kind of a network system seminar, so some of the students uh, come from electrical engineering, but the topic that I've chosen today will hopefully be uh, of interest to both uh, people in kind of um, computer science uh, side of things as well as um, um, electrical engineering because we're focusing really on learning, okay? So we're kind of uh, trying to um, understand things at a much higher level than oftentimes people in wireless work on, kind of, as Ender pointed out, working from radio technologies up. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, my research lab at UCLA um, is named CORES, Cognitive Reconfigurable Embedded Systems. And what we're trying to do is, um, our mission is to basically improve the spectrum utilization so that we can enable new wireless uh, systems. Um, and this talk is actually trying to kind of um, attack the problem of shared spectrum occupancy because as we'll see, the spectrum is a very limited resource and um, sharing is inevitable. And then um, here I will just highlight what learning can do for us so that we can improve uh, shared spectrum access. And the talk will focus basically on three topics. One is footprints. Most probably you, you have no idea what I'm talking about. It will become clear what I mean by footprint, topologies, and radio fingerprints. So just to start with a uh, motivation, as we all know, wireless demand for wireless uh, connectivity is tremendously increasing. And we have made great success in enabling what I will call a human type of communication. Everyone holds a cell phone, and we're kind of making calls, connecting, um, you know, downloading data, uploading uh, to the internet, and so forth. But the new wave, and actually that's what current 5G is trying to kind of address, is to enable new types of communication, oftentimes human to machine or machine to machine to machine to machine type of communication. But from really applications point of view, we want to enable new social important services being vehicular networks, public safety, healthcare networks, and then a new wave of Internet of Things where basically all the things will be um, connected home, within a home, let's say on the road, within a city. Um, now, one roadblock for that vision is actually the lack of spectrum. Okay? So um, basically, if you want to um, deploy licensed uh, systems, you have to pretty much purchase the spectrum. And unfortunately, all the spectrum up to 300 gigahertz has been already allocated. So there's actually not much uh, room to enable um, these new technologies. We have seen recent move to millimeter wave frequencies. That's where 5G is kind of moving to uh, much higher frequencies. However, everyone kind of agrees that due to favorable propagation losses of lower frequencies, we would still like to kind of uh, see what can be extracted from lower frequency bands. And the good news is that actually even though the spectrum from 0 to, let's say, 6 gigahertz um, is already allocated, it's heavily underutilized. So lots of measurements have shown that if you look at certain bands, the occupancy goes into like a single digit percent, okay, in terms of frequency. But then you say, what does occupancy mean? It actually has multiple dimensions. It has dimension of time, and then it has the dimension of space. So even if you look at, let's say, this is just an example of um, 2.4 gigahertz spectrum, we see that slicing now across frequency and time, you again see that spectrum is not 100% utilized. So there are these new opportunities, basically, for spectrum usage. In terms of tra traffic, basically, that's the, the bottom one. 
you look at um, across time, some frequency bands, being red ones, are occupied all the time. But some are used very intermittently. Okay? And on, on the other hand, we also look at the space. Like at some geographic locations, some frequencies are heavily used, but on the others, we, we don't have that case. So one example, and I'll talk about that later, was a TV white space. Basically, lots of spectrum has been allocated to television stations. And as we all know, if you go to rural areas or some remote areas, you don't have basically all, all the channels. Plus, we're all moving to digital broadcasts, so basically these frequencies uh, will be um, basically not, not heavily used. But you have to worry about worldwide deployment, so that's the reason you cannot only focus on the US. Okay. Um, so what's the idea? It's basically trying to, okay, we cannot do the reallocation. That would be one kind of solution to this problem. Just kind of go back to that chart and say whoever is using it can stay, whoever is not using it, maybe we can auction it and so forth. However, that's maybe not the most economical approach to do it, although from an engineering perspective it might be a viable. So now there is this emerging kind of um, um, trend in, in wireless communication, the spectrum has to be shared, okay? And when I mean sharing, going back to my dimensions, basically I can make, share it in time, frequency, and space. So here are the illustrations of, remember that there were bands that were not occupied, so I can basically, if I know what bands are not occupied, I can basically um, use them for communication. I can also use the time, if you remember my temporal traffic, I can interleave the transmission of another system that doesn't even have a license to, to do that. Or spatially, I can also find regions where the, uh, the, the, the primary user of the spectrum is not present and use that. So actually, there were a lot of um, pr proposals how we can enable this sharing. Some of them are basically, and we'll talk about that, opportunistic spectrum access, basically trying to, radios are in charge of finding what spectrum is used and opportunistically using it. There is uh, also, a proposal to have some real-time spectrum markets. Basically, the users that are not using it can offer that for a price. But now that license is kind of on a shorter time scale. Uh, there are also options of overlaying or underlaying transmission by basically uh, deciding what is the power level that you can use. Um, the, the one that has been um, ex uh, explored is basically a database control approach that you have a database that kind of logs all the uh, spectrum occupancy, so you would log in, like the way we do with Google Maps, let's say that's the analogy. Based on your location, you can get information what frequencies are used or not. However, there are a lot of issues with that in terms of deploying it, keeping it up to date, and also who is going to actually provide the measurements. Uh, okay? And there are hybrid approaches. So now, where is this actually being um, considered? All right, let's, let's be more specific. Well, in unlicensed bands, okay, being 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, we already have spectrum sharing. And even before all of this um, kind of idea of spectrum sharing came, engineers were basically required to design systems that can coexist. So we have 2.4 gigahertz, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, Zigbee, um, and, and so forth, um, versions of actually uh, Wi-Fi. In 5 gigahertz, we have Wi-Fi, LTE, unlicensed, okay? And then there is also a, a trend to expand this paradigm to license bands, okay? The ones that actually have a primary owner who purchased the license and introduced the spectrum sharing, as I mentioned, it's basically the TV white space. There is a, a sleeve of spectrum in 2.3 gigahertz, 3.5, where we have satellite as well as radars, and also uh, 5 gigahertz again, where we have LTE license, DSRC, and Wi-Fi. So what are the design goals for sharing? Well, this is kind of a very high level, but what would you like to do is to basically introduce a fairness now. That uh, users are basically, and that's kind of what unlicensed uh, technologies were required. Basically, no user was allowed to kind of grab the spectrum and use it and prevent others from uh, using like a CSMA type of protocol in, in uh, Wi-Fi. You also want to minimize the interference between the networks, and you, if there is a priority, and sometimes priority is enforced, let's say in TV white space, Basically, those were the primary, they wanted priority to the spectrum. Now, as I said, dynamic spectrum access perspective is basically, and this is what we're trying to say, uh, out of all the approaches, what can Laredius basically do um, to make this uh, spectrum usage uh, more dynamic? So, um, basically, again, just to remind you, uh, the, uh, 
the radios would use the spectrum if it's idle, and that means basically that other uh, networks are inactive. And not only that, but they also need to prevent the interference. So that's kind of the cognitive radio uh, approach. So no database, no markets, but rather, you know, can we build these smart radios that, as we'll talk in the class, uh, in, the, in the seminar, can learn something about uh, spectrum, um, can they basically ensure the interference? So now, why is avoiding interference hard? Okay, so, I mean, it depends on your assumptions, am I right? And what we're basically saying here is that this new entrance to the spectrum um, have some or, or basically no knowledge about who has been already there. You can think of a longer time scale or a shorter time scale. Whenever you show up in a band, you have no idea where are the other users and how many of them are there. What protocols are they using? Maybe you know something about the protocol, okay, it's a CSMA, but you don't know the details. And sometimes these protocols are vendor dependent, right? So we cannot enforce precise knowledge of all the parameter uh, protocol details. Uh, transmit power might be also unknown, just because you might have, it. it's, it's radio specific as well as protocol specific. And also the channel propagation model. But in essence, what makes this problem hard is that we assume that there is no cooperation. If you had some sort of control channel, maybe primary users can communicate this information or uh, you can use it to better estimate. So that kind of puts us in a very difficult position of kind of doing everything blindly, okay? So now, today we'll talk about three things that radios can do, cognitive radios can do, can basically learn uh, under these assumptions. The first one will be the spatial footprints of incumbents. If you remember, if I drop radios that want to opportunistically use the spectrum, they would like to know what are the other users of the spectrum, how many of them are there, and maybe locations, but we'll see that the location is actually not required, but rather their footprint. What I mean by that is that within that region, we're not allowed to do the transmission because um, the, they will be interfered with. And then we'll move um, to basically the next learning, which is after I identify you know, for each transmitter its footprint, now when I start observing their activity, can I identify them? Can I basically see transmission in the air and say, okay, now this is a transmitter one, let's call it transmitter one, or next time there is a transmitter two, okay? So then you can see that I can resolve over time who's talking, right? Think of this in the classroom, like when you hear a voice, you can say, you know, even though they're speaking, radios are basically speaking the same thing, they comply to the protocol, they're sending the same things over and over, you can still uh, distinguish them. And then the last one is from this identification, or I'll call it a fingerprint, you can actually build higher level cognition about who is talk talking to whom. So basically you can understand what I call network topology. And why is that important is because that allows you the next step, and that is the prediction of spectral occupancy. So basically where we wanna go is with all this knowledge, when I enter the spectrum, I know how I should take actions forward in terms of um, using the spectrum, okay? So um, let's uh, go step by step. So the first step is to understand what are the uh, spatially overlapping events, okay? So basically, we we'll understand immediately why I'm worrying about overlapping. Because if there is only one transmitter, I don't have to worry about it. As soon as you start uh, seeing multiple transmitters, they're basically overlapping um, in, in uh, frequency as well as space. Uh, at the bottom are actually uh, a few papers that, um, for those of you who are interested, there are details basically. I'm basing the talk uh, on these publications. So let's start with the, the problem. So the setup is the following. Um, I have incumbent networks. So basically I put them as a base basis. <coughs> there are um, M of them, but M is unknown. Okay, red basically determines I have uh, no idea how many transmitters are there. Uh, they transmit the power that's also unknown, and they actually have a spatial radiation pattern, which basically allows me to even consider transmitters that have, let's say, sectorized antennas, okay? And also, uh, they have some temporal activity. As we have seen, their traffic is, you know, they're on and off. That's how I'm modeling that, zero or one, with this uh, uh, variable uh, A, but that is not known uh, to the radios. And they also have unknown macro. So what my goal is uh, to basically 
deploy these cognitive, I mean, the uh, cognitive radios are deployed in the same geographic region as where these transmitters are. However, they have no knowledge about all these red unknown parameters. So, and the only thing that they can do is basically listen to the energy or find the energy that's, uh, measure the energy um, on a given channel. So now, and also I'm assuming uh, there is a fading channel and I cannot uh, use any knowledge because I have no way of estimating the channel. So basically every radio K will have an estimate of the energy based on the activity. If the user uh, transmitter is not present, it will measure the noise. If the user is, um, or the transmitter is present, then it will measure the energy which follows this uh, chi-square distribution. So now, based on these energy measurements over time, how can you make an inference of the following? So this, this is just to illustrate you. I have three transmitters, and two of them are sectorized. One is omnidirectional. I drop my cognitive radios, and I want to basically tag them with the information that each one of them hears a particular transmitter. Okay. So let's say the, the cross there, here's transmitter one and two, because it is in the spatial footprint of these two. Okay, and then we have a radio that hears only transmitter two, I have a radio that doesn't hear anyone, and so forth. Okay, so basically that's my goal. That's what I, that's what I call footprint. The radio will basically, every radio in my network will have a footprint. It will say, I can hear these transmitters. Therefore, I must not interfere with them if I know something else, and that's basically going into the temporal part, but that's the first time. So, there are actually other, uh, existing methods that people have used, um, and I'm kind of classifying them based on what is the knowledge that they uh, have in terms of whether they need channels, whether they handle spatial overlap, and whether they can handle this uh, non-omnidirectional transmission. So you might wonder, some of them require actually knowledge of the protocol. So if you have that, you can solve the problem. But if you remember, my assumption is that I don't have all the details about the protocol. There is an um, approach to use uh, some features of the signal, but they all have limitations, basically. Some of them even require multiple antennas. So as I said, what's nice about our approach is that all we need is the receive signal energy, which is basically you can measure it without any prior knowledge of the signal. So now let's see, what do these measurements, and remember, I'm using not only one radio, I'm basically looking at what cognitive radios in the network are measuring. So there's actually embedded cooperation between them. Just to illustrate, I'm gonna take a very simple case of two cognitive radios and two transmitters, okay? So their measurements, if you look at their energy, uh, are basically what we call Gaussian mixture model. And that is, um, if you look at this plot, this is the energy of cognitive radio one and energy of cognitive radio two. I have four clouds, okay? What do these clouds correspond to? The cloud here is basically that both cognitive radio one and cognitive radio two are measuring the noise, which means that neither one of them can hear transmitter one or transmitter two. This cloud here tells me that cognitive radio one hears transmitter one and this one does not hear, which is basically telling me that um, cognitive radio one belongs to a uh, uh, spatial footprint of transmitter one. And then you have the purple one is actually when they hear both, okay? So you see that um, based on the measurements, I can, this is a simple case that I can draw in 2D, but you can scale this to basically K cognitive radios and M um, transmitters, all right? It's gonna become multidimensional uh, kind of clouds in the space. But um, what's nice about it is that you can actually do the processing of these measurements and um, find the components. What are the components? The components are effectively these uh, red and yellow clouds where you have that each radio can hear a transmitter independently. Because the, the purple one actually you can add by summing red and yellow. That's basically what both of them hear uh, simultaneously. So, in terms of uh, complexity, with M transmitters, I have two to the M possible uh, components. And there is a complexity basically associated if you, if you do it through a brute force, in terms of finding how many components you have and mapping that. What we have developed is basically a learning algorithm that kind of 
iterates over these measurements and builds uh, or basically informs us about both how many transmitters are there as well as what are for each radio um, transmitters that he can hear. So this is how uh, basically it starts an online algorithm and um, for every measurement that the cognitive radio gets, let's say there is a circle there, of course you start with single measurements and then as you get more uh, views of the channel and, and noise, you will end up with distributions of energy that belong to those clouds. So the first, and we know basically that this is a distribution. Um, so what, uh, basically the algorithm does is it, it receives the energy. Okay, so this is our first sample. It's gonna say there is a, a component. Remember there are two to the m components and I'm trying to basically uh, resolve them. From here, I'm computing the component uh, variance and kind of waiting for the next sample to come. So now there is a new sample of received energy, and what I need to do is I need to find the distance between the previous measurements and, and this one to decide whether it's a new component or not. So for that, we use this um, Mahalanobis uh, distance that is basically our separation uh, criteria. And if that's basically exceeding the, not exceeding the threshold, I have to add a new component. Basically, that's a new component. I compute its variance and I move on. Um, new sample, now we see that it falls, it follows this route, it's basically within a threshold, and that's kind of, I'm not adding new component, that's the component I already recognized, and um, I update the number of sources to be, um, to, I update also their mean, because every measurement will kind of help me average out and get that um, chi-square distribution. And then if you get a new component, then you add so forth. There is actually another part which is, and if you start adding components, you have to be smart about clouds because you have to check whether the components, uh, when you merge them or add them up, are resulting in a component that you already have. Okay? So that you are not adding components that are already kind of some of energies um, that you already see. So there is actually a step. Yes? So is this done pairwise when you have more than one? Yeah, this is done uh, for Basically, for every, yeah, it's a multi-dimensional, so you have to get that component, which is energy vector. But, but if you have, say, three cognitive radios, mm -hmm. then you'd add another dimension to this. Yeah, yeah, you add the, the, it's basically a vector space. Yeah. So this is kind of the, the EK measurement, right? So even for this sample, it's a two-dimensional, right? I have energy that cognitive radio one measured, energy, so if it's three, then it's a three-dimensional space. But I can. Yeah. You're also assuming that the transmitters are full. That's a, that's a big assumption. You're right. Like that, that, because I am capturing the the fading, but I I kind of have to average out that fading, or ideally I would not like it to move significantly, right? right. So that the path loss kicks in. Okay. All right. So. This is basically the algorithm that uses the soft reports. We have actually done algorithms that you will see in the result doesn't perform as well, and that's um, taking the measurements, you can actually do uh, kind of um, hard reports, you can quantize them, and then you kind of reduce the dimensions of basically these clouds to really uh, dots in the space, but we have, and, and then you use like a graph matching to, to build this, um, uh, dissecting it to a number of components. What is special about the Mahalanobis system? It's basically a statistical measure for this chi-square distribution in terms of distances. Okay. Um, so what we have basically, so there are, if you look at the Gaussian mixture model literature, there are actually algorithms that um, solve it, but the complexity is super exponential. In M. So basically with this, and exploiting the fact, okay, so this is one thing that I didn't mention, and all, the, all we need is that we have radios, remember that alpha, which is activity factor, so each radio will uh, have uh, at least one measurement that gives them noise, as well as uh, single transmitter transmission, okay? So that um, you can do that. And basically this is not hard assumption because, I mean, where this does not apply is if you have a continuous transmission of all M transmitters at the same time, okay? So you need to have that. So basically this is separability assumption. 
So here is um, basically a simulation. We have done uh, slotted aloha. It's basically what our transmitters are. Uh, and here I'm varying from, let's say, one to four uh, transmitters randomly placed and increasing the number of radios that are doing this uh, spatial uh, footprint. So there are two metrics that I have. One is the probability that I will detect all of them, okay, and actually collect correctly um, kind of identify footprints. And this one is that I think that there are more <coughs> radios. It's a kind of false alarm, right? You think that there are more transmitters that are actually uh, there. So in terms of performance, we have, this is our soft report, which is a solid line. With, let's say, three cognitive radios, you can already detect there are four uh, transmitters uh, in, the, in your geographic region with 97% probability. And as I told you, we're using hard reports as well as this um, minimum tail probability. However, they are kind of, uh, as you add more radios, thinking that there are more, co more transmitters in the network. So they are kind of all um, making errors, if you like. The soft report is the one, actually, that is the most uh, reliable. Now, how this information can be used further, basically, one application is now that I have this knowledge of footprints, I can actually localize these transmitters, okay? Even if they are unknown location, what I can do is, because remember, every radio now has a label which transmitter it can hear. So the, the, the dark crosses are the ones that can hear, let's say, transmitter one, which is a blue square. And then I can use them and there is actually a very simple algorithm we have uh, explored from the literature. It's called weighted centering localization. It basically finds, based on received energy, it can find kind of the location of the transmitter based on the center uh, mass of the energy, if you like. Similarly, you separate the spatial footprint of the of transmitter 2, and then you find its location. So basically, the estimated one is the triangle, and you can see that we are fairly accurate with this. So this gives you, because if you are using energy alone, okay, without doing this separation of footprints, you would not conclude that there are four transmitters. And furthermore, if you were trying to use any energy-based localization algorithm, you would end up with one location, which is meaningless. This way, you are kind of separating them and saying there are four transmitters at these locations. Okay? So now, the next one is, okay, I know that there are four transmitters. Now, I want to in time domain, decide who, who is, if I see a transmission, let's say, for example, I'm a radio that hears three transmitters, okay? How can I say in temporal kind of way, uh, transmitter one versus transmitter two versus the transmitter three? So that's what I call fingerprint, right? Like, almost like seeing their faces. So this is um, an approach that we have exploited for fingerprinting, actually it has broader applications than in here, but the idea is to kind of um, use, and, and the reason why we're going to um, this is because the radios are transmitting, this is basically the idea, even if they're transmitting the same uh, signal, sometimes they're sending beacons or preambles, the signals are the same, but the transmitters are different. So you can actually not look at their time waveforms directly to make the fingerprint, because they might be sending the same information, but rather, you have to look at the small differences in their uh, transmission. So what we have uh, exploited is that these transmitters are built out of radio components that cannot be tampered in software, okay? Um, or changed in software. So we have uh, DAC, digital analog converter, a clock, oscillator, power amplifier. And these components, um, basically not perfect, they're not the same. Every transmitter, even if they belong to, let's say, same Wi-Fi network, every access point, will have a slight variability of these components. And then the question is, can we use that to basically identify them? So this is the identification problem. If you assume that there are N transmitters, each transmitter will have what I'll call a unique fingerprint, uh, Fi, and then if I basically listen, this is my radio that listens, can I say which one of the N is currently being uh, active? So there are many existing approaches in the literature for fingerprinting, and some of them are kind of relying on uh, processing of received samples in terms of finding, let's say, start of the packet, because maybe each transmitter will have a slide. This is really slight variation in how they uh, transmit the packet. 
higher layers we don't even bother about this, right? They are decoding these modulation schemes perfectly. But um, here we're kind of looking at small differences um, at the start of the packet or carrier frequency. This is a very hard problem if you want to go with feature estimation and identifying transmitters. So in recent years, people have actually started looking at machine learning approaches where they can use neural networks to solve the problem of this identification. So there are actually um, work, uh, works that um, look at just IQ samples. What I, you remember, receives uh, energy was basically what I get just by sampling the signal over the air. So now I take IQ samples, and can I identify um, these transmitters? So um, one feature that we, and we have actually uh, proposed two things. One is we have tried to identify what is the component that will give us a nice feature for um, this identification. So we looked at actually a power amplifier. That's basically um, the circuit that you have in every radio that comes right before the antenna on the transmitter side that gives you this um, amplification gain. So it usually have a characteristic. You apply some signal uh, voltage, and then you get amplified so that you can output at the right uh, transmitter level. And Hypothesis was, and we'll, we'll actually have to perform the measurement, that different transmitters will have slight differences in these uh, transfer characteristic of um, power amplifier. So our approach was that we actually did some measurements in, uh, of uh, power amplifier uh, of transmitters actually, without power amplifiers, and we have first um, built a model that is. Um, following this amplification as a function of input. R is, let's say, voltage that you put at the input. You get output AI of R. It depends on these parameters alpha and beta. And you can do a least square fit to kind of find curves that are following this. So now the way we uh, proceeded to model the variation that will make basically our um, identification um, scalable to a larger number of transmitters, if you like, is we have kind of performed 100 measurements. The colors correspond to different radios. We use USRP radios in our lab, as well as we swept them across different frequency range. And from there on, we have developed the model of that, uh, those two parameters. I'm just showing alpha here, alpha and beta. And here we kind of extrapolated from this model how would variance between the transmitters in terms of that power amplifier nonlinearity depend. So S being 0.01 means that, OK, this is like a base station highest end transmitter where you're controlling, you're spending a lot of money on your power amplifier, okay? Yes? Uh, is this being measured at the receiver or? Transmitter. Everything is at the transmitter. So, uh, I mean, the radius are going to receive the signal, right? So, dark. Okay, so this is basically one, one receiver. In this case, one cognitive receiver can uh, tag, let's say, N transmitters. So, you're right, like, the receiver will also have its own in this case, low noise amplifier, but that one is uh, kind of out of the picture because it's common for all N transmitters. You're right, you would have a problem if you want to combine multiple cognitive radios because their own variabilities will now be superimposed. So you would have, but right now, actually, I'm kind of going down to each radio could basically say <coughs> independent. So only, only the transmitter and only the area matters. Okay? So now that we have this, um, okay, so. There are actually a lot of uh, um, questions we, we got about this. Um, ideally, what I would like to have is measurement. Like for every learning problem, <laughs> what you need is data. The more data you have, the better. Here we're kind of limited in terms of data we have. We have a very small sample size of uh, measurements. Even hundreds might be, some people argue, not sufficient. And um, the modeling we have done is um, more like a hypothesis that this will happen. Uh, but still, it's worthwhile exploring how would, with different variations, let's say high-quality transmitters versus low-quality transmitters, how would uh, basically um, algorithm perform? And the algorithms are kind of standard um, machine learning um, classifiers. We have exploited two. One is the fully connected uh, neural network, and the other one is the convolutional neural network. Now, in terms of... Um, what are the features? That's always the problem when you try to do this identification. We have tried with IQ samples, and we have also looked at 
basically power spectral density um, in Cartesian, polar, and magnitude normal. Okay, and here is basically how these algorithms perform. The red one is for bad transmitters, right? As being very large, you have lots of differences. This is actually a very good transmitter. And again, as you can see, this one told us that magnitude and convolutional neural network actually gives us the best result for that sample size. So here is just uh, to kind of show you some results on the uh, identification, basically understanding. There were parameters that we wanted to understand. First one is whether the data the transmitter is sending, let's say 10 transmitters, are, if they're sending same data versus different data. And why is that important? If they're all sending the same data, then actually there is no randomness in the data. All randomness that you see is due to that power amplifier being different. If you add different data, then your power amplifier variability might be masked, right? So that was kind of the, the hypothesis. The other one was, what if they're sending different modulation schemes, right? How would the performance change? Uh, number of transmitters and their variability, as well as whether I have noise, if I have, and the dynamic channel actually corresponds to fading, timing, and a frequency offset, and also signal to noise ratio. Turns out, um, here's basically the result as a function of, you know, this is SNR, basically, at the cognitive radio, how strong is the signal that I'm hearing from a transmitter? And we see that with, let's say, 15 to 20 dB, we're already reaching performance of, let's say, 70 or 80%. Um, obviously, the uh, same, this is same data. That's always better, as we expected. And then different data is the blue and uh, red, meaning that randomness of data impacts you, but if you look at it, it's not that big of a gap. <coughs> and the other one is the dynamic channel versus just noise only. So we see that the noise only also helps us improve as opposed to uh, dynamic channel. Um, we are also interested in how well this performs as a function of number of transmitters. So we actually went to extreme of increasing the number of transmitters to thousands. Okay? This was actually for another application, which is kind of in IoT space where you have lots of transmitters. You might actually need to do that over a larger space. And if you were basically randomly guessing, this would be the curve, right? Probability of making a correct decision would go at 1 over Tx. If you have same transmission on all of them, we see that it's pretty robust, let's say up to 100 transmitters, if that's your performance uh, metric. And then if you have fading, then you actually have a penalty, sorry, not fading, different data. Basically, that's kind of the gap between um, you know, whether you have a preamble or a beacon that you're going to use that's same for everybody as opposed to a random data. And also, this is kind of how it performs as a function of quality of the transmitters. So remember that S being 1 was actually very lousy transmitters. And here we are with S being, let's say, 0 0.01, which is kind of maybe base station type of high quality uh, transmitter. Similarly, in terms of uh, modulation, uh, performance is actually not so dependent on which modulation scheme you use. It, uh, no. It's fairly. Question. Yes. So when you increase the number of transmitters, how do you associate the like, current transmitters with who actually sent them? So let's say you have three transmitters and you're looking at them. Do you assume that you know that when I get a new transmitter, the transmission belongs to one, two, or three? Well, you have to train that. That's the training part. Okay? You have to have a training phase for that. So you have to know what the yeah. transmitters look like. Yeah. That's actually a very good point. Because it would be nice to do it more online. Uh, that you start with no knowledge, basically, and then you build that. But that's a different learning problem. That's very interesting. I don't want to brag about it. We got the best paper award for this one at RCNC this year. So, uh, very cool idea. Thank you. Um, also, the question of you know packet size that you use. Obviously, the more data you have, you would improve uh, the detection. And we have also uh, performed some measurements uh, with actual transmitters. Um, here is basically, unfortunately, the very small sample size of seven USRPs that we have. And what was um, the experimentals are basically blue, blue and uh, red. And the interesting part was actually the red one, which is experimental data. We got the highest performance. And same data, okay? When you send the same, let's say, preamble, 
you get the highest. And we expected actually the same will be better than the different data. What was nice about this getting 100% is actually there are other imperfections that we didn't account for. For example, ammo leakage was even stronger feature than PA and all the area. So I think there is, this is actually a very fruitful field to look into, even for security, if you like. I didn't talk about security here, but security is also kind of, you know, our fingerprints to authenticate IoT devices. I think this has, this has a very nice application. Okay. So now we know transmitters. We know which one we can hear. We can, when we hear them, we can tell who they are. So what's the next step? This is the last step, actually before I can predict what's going to happen next. And that is, okay, so this is a scenario now. Let's say I have six transmitters, and my fingerprinting or identification can tell me over time who's talking. I can, who is talking, then red is talking, then yellow, and so forth. So I'm adding basically colors. So what my next step will be is I want to identify who is talking to who. Basically, I want to build this adjacency matrix, if you like, to say that this is one network and this is another part. Furthermore, I want to kind of understand who is responding to whom, because that can be my prediction in terms of how is spectrum going to be used over time. Is this problem clear now? Okay. So, so basically we want to find, I call it a topology. If you think about these are two networks and this is their topology, but effectively, what I'm learning is, I'm learning this edge. And it can be one directional, it could be two directional, okay? So the edge exists, and this is kind of our um, assumption, that if two radios are connected with the edge, at least one to respond, responds to the transmission of the other, okay? And this is not an unreasonable assumption if you look at standards, which, by the way, I don't assume that I know, but, for example, GSM, LT, Zigbee, A211, they all have, based on the protocols that they have, some sort of response, okay? For example, Zigbee has uh, an acknowledgement, and A211 you have CTS, acknowledgement data, and so forth, okay? So, basically links uh, exist if there is a response. One transmission, a radio response with some. And furthermore, there is a response time, which is non-random, and as we will see, a lot of things in the transmission are random. Packet size can be long. The back of time can be long. However, the responses are within <coughs> fixed time. Okay, you always get that acknowledgement within fixed time. And that is the feature that we are going to explore. So, basically, the network topology, the way I'm thinking about it, is a causality graph. Okay, so um, and now we have to build that causality graph out of basically this measurement data. So this is a let's say, A to the dot 11 activity simulating NS3. Uh, so what do I observe for these six uh, uh, elements, six nodes, is that, let's say, one, send a packet, and then two, response, right? That's what you would see uh, in terms of acknowledgement. Uh, similar things happen between, let's say, four and six, uh, four and five, and so forth. So actually, Given that we designed this, right, I can tell you what the topology is, right? I have a um, connection between um, 4, 5, and 6, and then I have a connection between 3, uh, 1, and 2 that corresponds to this um, sample trace, okay? So now, of course, this is the genie knowledge. How can I get that from this sample, okay? So actually, this uh, problem has been already... Um, studied in the literature. Uh, let me just kind of give you a, a, a behind. Instead of, so what's the information here? I have, let's say, packet lens, I have response lens. <coughs> Different things can tell you the causality. We're looking for causality. What is the cause of certain transmission, okay? So um, in order to look at the cause, we're actually not looking at events. We're not saying the packet was sent. We're looking only at events of such transmission, started, transmission, and end. So I'm going to decimate basically my samples. Um, this is the sampled activity. I'm going to basically convert it into um, events. For example, for user one, I'm going to just mark when the transmission started, and for user i and user j, when the transmission started. So it's basically just aligning, um, basically this. This is my transmission start, and I and I kind of create a 
that. So I get these time sequences of zeros and ones that are now uh, transmit start indicators. So this was actually already used uh, in a literature by Moore and Davenport to uh, infer the causality whether I and J are talking to each other. Um, there is a <clears throat> another work that, in addition to start, they added also end indicators. So you can see there are now e events are basically transmitted, uh, started transmission and ended transmission, and that's basically used in um, Rosenwood, uh, Tilman Rosenwood approach. So now, where do you go from here? You have to basically build what I call a test statistic, right? This is going to be compared to a threshold and say, if this statistic, based on what you compute out of here, is larger than a threshold, I and J are talking. If it's less than a threshold, they are not talking, okay? So what these two groups have done is they have used um, basically linear regression to predict the behavior of a sample, let's say, XJ, of a destination node, based on activities of, let's say, transmit and start of I and J. So typically you see a model that the present sample, X, J, T, is built out of the history. And then there are different ways of combining destination history and um, source history, okay? As, as you have seen, both of them are using for I and J start of transmission or start and end. So that's basically what X, I, and J is about. And then, Hypothesis zero is basically that you have just uh, noise. Now they have different ways of fitting that. One is uh, bivariate linear regression. The other one is um, kind of multivariate regression. Okay, and I'll show you the performance. Okay, basically, what really depends on how much history you're taking to basically fit whether what you predicted and what actual measurement gave you match. And based on that, you decide. How now, we have actually departed this um, existing work and um, used the concept of causality in a slightly different way. Uh, way. There is this um, Granger causality idea where you are kind of looking at more probabilistic way. This is kind of deterministic. You're computing linear sum of previous samples to predict what's your next sample and seeing where that fits your model. Okay? Here, as I said, we're using the probabilistic model and that's whether this sample, xj of t, follows in distribution what I've seen in the past. Now, we also changed the features. If you remember, we're not actually using start time and end time precisely. The other ones we had was packet length, inter-arrival time. Those were variable, so we couldn't exploit them. So the one that we actually used is a response time. Um, there is also a question of how much history do we use to test this causality. That actually applies to both our work as well as, because sometimes using too long of a history can basically hurt you uh, in terms of uh, linking the causality. So let me just um, show you the, the idea. As I said, and I already hinted that we are looking at the response time. So basically when the, tr the source uh, ends the transmission, the destination will respond within a fixed time, unknown to us still, uh, to this transmission. And that will basically create a link between source and destination. Just to kind of substantiate my um, assumption, we have in 8.11, uh, for example, this um, SIFS um, time that is basically uh, within plus minus 10 of, of slot time that we can exploit. So this is how I'm going to build that uh, test statistic in my case, which is not linear regression. I'm going to take Transmission and indicators from both I and J, okay? I don't know, I mean, I, the hypothesis is that I is a source, J is a destination, okay? So I take samples from those two, and I mark end transmissions, those are the different ones, and for my um, J node, let's say my destination, I also mark a start transmission. Why is that? Because the de destination is supposed to respond, right? So. That's kind of the start transmission uh, indicator, okay? And then I'm saying basically whether I can predict the start transmission indicator based on the past. The past being how I and J um, ended their transmission. So this is the uh, test statistic. I told you ours is probabilistic, and it's actually based on the Granger uh, causality theory in the form of asymmetric transfer entropy. Okay, so it's basically for I and J, every pair of them, it's pairwise, I can build prior to my samples an estimate, right, of the 
uh, this uh, asymmetric transfer entropy. Okay. So the test is very simple. If this is my test statistic between I and J. We actually know from the uh, statistical theory that it follows um, chi-square distribution. So it's again a hypothesis test, like I told you. They communicate or not. And the only hard part is actually, actually it's not hard. The threshold can be set based on what is the false alarm that you can set between the links. And then we also have to find uh, this Tij. And that's basically the response time. Because this uh, 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 test statistic works under hypothesis that there is a fixed transmission time, meaning that you cannot take arbitrary lengths of data, because after one point you, I mean, if it's too short, you won't see the causality. If it's too long, then again, other th things can mask your causality. For example, collisions. Okay? Um, so this is basically the thing we proposed, how to estimate this response time. So uh, what we did is, we basically looked at, we, what we do is we sweep tau, how much history you look at, and asymmetric transfer uh, entropy. So what happens is if link one and two um, are communicating, right? that's the blue one, we will see that due to the response, I have this jump in the uh, asymmetric transfer entropy. And that happens for a particular tau, which is three, and that's how I find my response time. For the links two and three, I basically don't see that jump, and I know that this, this is basically my sample uh, network, I don't have um, connection between them. So you see some entropy because both of them are talking, but there is no jump that corresponds to that um, causality between them. So we have performed um, the analysis of this in uh, NS3 for the 8.2.11, and basically that first example that I've shown you. And the goal was really to identify the topology in terms of fraction of undirected links detected, as well as num uh, average number of extra links. Uh, we have also compared it with uh, linear regression models that people have proposed. So this is the actual topology. I have two networks. One is kind of the star network with the access point. The other one is also a star network, but they are not um, talking to each other. Okay. So here is the metric of average number of detected links. So 100% will be I detected all links correctly. But at the same time, you actually have to look at kind of counterpart, how many of these links are actually erroneous being extra links. For example, you know, I might detect that there is a, or think that there is a link, while there is not. Okay? And here we see how much time do I have to observe a link to find it out. So if you have enough time, you will actually infer for all the algorithms. The difference is basically the Tillman and Rosenblatt um, and Moore and Davenport are the blue one and the green one, and our approaches are basically the yellow and purple, these two. Okay? So in terms of performance, actually, if you think about this part, okay, they're quicker, somewhat, but the Tillman can find it very quickly. But where he pays the price is actually here. He shortens the window of his linear regression, but then he makes um, lots of erroneous decisions. What's actually nice about our approach is the purple and the yellow, those are the Granger causality ones, are keeping accuracy over a long period of time. So they're actually not kind of adding some links that don't already exist. You might, but as you see, after a long period of time, we all learn, but we improve significantly over uh, this detection. Now, what happens is if you add more transmitters, this is basically increasing the number of uh, transmitters, um, again, the same metrics, so the number of um, detected links is um, correct, but again, the proposed one is keeping the uh, number of extra links close to zero, while everybody else is making these uh, mistakes. So, I hope I, I went a little fast at the end, but I think you got the idea that, I mean, this is actually a very interesting and challenging problem, because uh, inferring all the links between radios without even knowing who's talking to whom or where they are is an interesting problem. I think it has other applications, even social networks and stuff like that, but we're staying within wireless um, networks. Um, so just to summarize on what we have um, looked into is really, I would, I would say, still very simple approaches to uh, learn a lot about um, other coexisting network 
or networks in, in, the, in the vicinity based on measurements such as um, energy or just raw IQ samples. So what we can do is we can find these um, spatial footprints and basically distinguish what are the radios that we can hear. We can also fingerprint them so that we can tag our uh, time transmissions. And then we can also infer links uh, between radios, even if the protocol has changed. Okay? Now, again, I have to make a disclaimer. There was a strong assumption that I made, and that is that it is a fixed response time. So if the protocols do not have fixed response time, then our approach would um, fail. Okay? So as I said, possible directions are really predicting the spectrum uh, occupancy as well as uh, applying this. The spatial footprints already found application in routing. You can basically create routes so that you avoid uh, kind of transmitters that are in your network. But I think time domain dom uh, dimension is less explained. All right, so this is the end. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, speaker. So I have one question. If one of the transmitters is a satellite, do you need to do something special? In terms of uh, what footprint or? Yeah. In terms of received energy, you don't have to do anything special. In terms of temporal, uh, I don't know if there are any acknowledgments. If there are, I, I guess it would maybe apply to my assumption, yes. If, if there is something different about their acknowledgment, then it's probably have to change. Have to look at a new feature, but I think that Granger causality is a very powerful tool, and as we have seen, uh, solves the problems of linear regression or kind of more naive approaches of fitting to the model. Okay. Um, I was wondering if you differentiate between access points and stations in terms of uh, how that one works, mm -hmm. or you're applying to that assumption. Sorry, one more time. You differentiate between access points and stations. No, no, I'm actually. Actually, after this step, let's say here, all I have identified is basically the arrows. And then you can say, this is access point. So That's actually, because of the frequency of... I mean, can, I, guess, I guess based on this, can you infer that That's, yeah. blue is the... Maybe, but I'm not making that assumption up front, if that's your question. Right. I'm just thinking of them as radios that are transmitting. They're talking, right? And then I'm kind of building these clicks of... Uh, Likewise here. But then you can probably infer that. Right? Actually, I, I skipped that, but I, in the paper we have uh, got samples from, there were people from the AWO Research Lab who have done a uh, um, ad hoc network where they had a route. And we were actually able to follow, there were actually 35 nodes arranged in a grid. Sorry, I deleted that slide because of the time. But in the paper, there is actually a grid of um, nodes and it's like a multi-hop routing, and we were able to find uh, you know, the entire link where the, and the direction, right? So uh, for the fingerprinting part, uh, you mentioned about the invariabilities which are inherent to each and every device. Mm -hmm. So is it, I'm just trying to understand, is it very similar to those uh, physically unclonable functions, or is it something different? So basically I presume that you're a computer science student. And that, what do you mean by physically unclonable? So basically, uh, they also claim the invariability aspect of the physical hardware and then to distinguish it yeah. based on that. Yeah, yeah. So you remember the function fi, which I called fingerprint, was probably, you can think of them as physical. Basically, there is nothing in software that you can do to change it. But in your approach, it was coming from this uh, last part, what you call it, the non-linearity part of the PA? Or mm -hmm. whatever yes, yes. So that hardware will be the backbone for that? Yes, hardware. but I think that if you really, I, I, I think, remember the measurements have shown that there are other features that we have not measured. So what happens with your data, which is digital, let's say your zeros and ones, once they hit that whole change, the, the chain of digital to analog converter, the mixer, the power amplifier, you get all sorts of unclonable functions, yeah. and basically there is a cascade of them. The hard part is that some of them are nonlinear, so modeling that is really hard. We kind of, I think, put ourselves in a, in a difficult position of trying to model this by saying, you know, we're going to do the fit and stuff like that, and that was solely because we didn't have enough data. I think what would be nice to have is, let's say, 
hundreds or thousands of radios, you feed them with the same kind of protocol, let's say data, preamble, whatever, you measure, and that becomes your training set, and then you infer. But again, you will see the differences. But you don't recommend using more than one. Like, for example, you mentioned DAC oscillators and other... Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I would like to use, but I don't have a, a way to model that. Yeah, I would like to. The only way I think we can proceed is by really building a database with measurements. Because it's, it's high, even this one was nonlinear. And then each one of them being nonlinear, and then you have a cascade of nonlinear systems. That, that function becomes too complicated. Let me give you the password for today. It's wireless, all in small letters. Any other questions? Let's thank the speaker once again. <laughs>